perfectly machined pieces that were hard to make and proprietary to him, and a little measurement device. And the measurement device would measure horsepower output, and he'd show up at the end of the month with a bill based on how much power you generated. He didn't sell James Watt's steam engine. He sold an engine as a service. Very different business model. The reason that he kept making money every year, and that's why we call them Watts, because Newton sold a steam engine, and that was the engine that you had one, you didn't need to call Newton anymore. Um, this is happening today when you talk to General Electric. General Electric sells engines, but they kind of sell thrust. Every time one of these engines pulls up at a, an airport, it downloads a whole bunch of data, and that data goes back to GE, and GE compares the weather conditions that plane engine flew through to all the other planes that have gone through it and it analyzes vibrations and all kinds of other stuff. It's a ridiculous amount of data per time this thing lands. And then GE proactively sends you a repair part. So let's say that GE is charging you $1,000 per flight hour, whatever the number is, and their costs to manage this are $800 a flight hour, and now they apply analytics, and now their costs go down to 700 and 600 So Bill Rue, who told me this story, heads up analytics of GE, he said that the, the airlines have actually come back and said, wait, you're making too much money off us. We had no idea you were going to do this. Even though GE is known for material sciences, he believes strongly that most of the upside that General Electric is going to see comes from analytics. This idea of learning, they have wind farms that learn from one another. Each wind farm, each turbine is slightly differently positioned and is telling the others, hey, I got a little more wind over here, turn left. Crazy, right? So the challenge in innovation is for intrapreneurs to try and find these disruptive changes, to go in and fundamentally shift the business model, like MetLife did, like Watts did, like Taser did, like General Electric is doing. This term, intrapreneur, is a pretty specific word. It's kind of new, it sounds kind of buzzy. It's someone working to produce disruptive change in an organization that has already found a sustainable, repeatable business model. Because the definition of a startup, according to Steve Blank, is an organization searching for a sustainable, repeatable business model. By definition, a corporation is an organization designed to perpetuate. Everything about an organization is designed to perpetuate a business model. The entire org chart, your job description, your sales channel, your contracts are designed to perpetuate the existing business model. As a result, if you're an entrepreneur, you're fighting town hall. You're basically trying to do stuff the organization is designed not to do, which is change things. That makes you a pariah. Successful entrepreneurs are pariahs. I mean, they're slumlords. They're selling to people that don't have money, the deviants, the weirdos. They're like Amazon going out to lunch with CTOs and startups instead of CIOs. Um, they're narcissists. They're worried constantly about how they're going to get attention for the stuff they're working on. They're, they're a huge security risk. They run around saying we should be open and transparent and let's share stuff with people. Uh, they're fundamentally job killers. They're like, look, if I do this right, we can eliminate half the jobs and destroy a company. Um, they're cannibals. They want to eat the existing revenue streams if their stuff takes off. And they're horrible listeners. They're willfully ignoring everything the best customers say. This is why the elephant can't dance. Because when organizations have people in them who want to be innovators, they look like pariahs. What I have found is that in some organizations, there is a recognition of this. And they go out of their way to create an acceptable world in which these kinds of people can thrive. So I'm going to give you a few examples of stuff they've done that works well. Um, Intrapreneurs do lots of things differently. Um, first of all, they think lean and analytically. Um, you guys obviously sound a big fan of the lean startup movement and of analytics. Um, and uh, there's a great quote by Roger Brenner, the plural of anecdote is not data. <laughs> Analysts need to look at data to understand what's really happening. The fundamental lesson of Lean Startup is that Kevin Costner is a lousy entrepreneur. Actually, he's not, he's a pretty good entrepreneur. But Kevin Costner in Field of Dreams was a terrible entrepreneur. If you build it, they will come, is what every engineer wants, and it never happens. If they come, you should build it. That old adage, if you build a better mousetrap, the world will be a path to your door. No, figure out a way to get the world to your door. Ask them what they want. They may want a fire hydrant. If you are an engineer, if 
you're a product manager, you love to build things. The core idea in Lean Startup is this cycle that says I got a bunch of ideas, I want to build something, I'll launch it as a product, hopefully the minimum product I need to quantify the risks involved, I'll measure what happens, I'll collect that data, I'll learn from it. The problem with this is we're all liars. I mean, everyone's idea is the best, right? My idea is the best, your idea is the best, everyone's idea is the best. And we love this part of building because it feels good. We've got complete control over how good or bad that thing is. Other people, they're messy. They're uncertain, but I can build this thing. It's mine, I got control over it. And so you build this thing, you tend to not put in the measurement stuff, or you leave it for an afterthought, and there's no learning because you didn't collect any data. So good entrepreneurs are allergic to this. Good entrepreneurs are fundamentally about collecting data. Everything they do is an experiment. As a result, every time they try something, they're like, what did we learn? And this works. There's a good study by Eric Brunelson from MIT that shows that companies that use data-driven analytics instead of just raw intuition get 5 to 6% higher productivity and profits than their competitors. I can see TM going, I gotta take a picture of that slide. This is, I mean, just compound it over a few years, and you can see why incumbents are beating up the old, uh, why incumbents are getting beaten up by the old people. Now, I'm not going to go into the whole lean analytics thing. I will say to you that the metric you watch at a certain stage of your company based on the business model is important, and you should focus your company on one metric that matters. Uh, we have a big, ugly grid that basically says, as companies go through these phases of empathy and stickiness and virality and revenue and scale, um, there are different metrics you should watch. I don't expect you to see a CSI chart. You should go to this URL instead. If you go to bit.ly slash big lean table, uh, you will see uh, like a three page PDF that has all of the different stages of, that a company can go through and all of the different business models. It has a bunch of detail in there. Uh, if you got one of these books, it's in there too. So that's the extent of what I'm gonna say about, about the lean startup part, but most of the people who are doing innovation in companies are successful because they have a very lean startup attitude. GE is currently doing lean startup training with Eric Rees for 400,000 employees. And the results are pretty amazing. Just Google like lean startup enterprise. They're getting incredible results in very big companies. Some other things that are a little different that I thought were kind of useful. So I talked to DHL about their innovation model and they said, we have an attitude where we don't launch companies, we do research. You know how we do research? By launching companies. So they go to their boss, there was a good example where uh, some people had said, oh, logistics companies like DHL are gonna be out of business because everyone will get a 3D printer, print something at home, and all will ship around as pieces of raw plastic. So DHL said, well, um, can we have some money to study the 3D printing market? Oh, sure, here's a bunch of money. By the way, if you're a big company of that size, it costs $500,000 to do anything. For some of us, it's called seed round. <laughs> so you go, hey, can I have half a million dollars to study the 3D printing market? Sure, okay, I'll back in six months with the report. Hey, look, I'm starting a 3D printing company, which fails horribly or does really well. And then you go back to your boss and go, great news. I've researched the 3D printing industry. It's horrible. Please don't go into it. Here's everything I know about why those companies won't succeed. Or I say, great news. I researched the 3D printing industry. It's incredibly successful. Oh, by the way, I accidentally started a company. But in both cases, you haven't triggered the immune system of the risk-averse host company. Because you said, great news, I've got a study. And guess what, it's a really good study because I lived in that world for six months. So if you can frame your initiative as a study, it's a very good way to extract resources from the company without triggering the immune system of don't you dare innovate to change the business model. I talked to a group from Code for America uh, that have been working to fix the failure to appear rate. The FTA or failure to appear rate is the amount of money, uh, so the, the number of people that don't show up for their trial at the court. Um, it's around 18% in Kentucky. It's a horrible thing because if you don't show up in court, it tends to lead to a violent arrest. There's some resisting arrest, there's incarceration. Often these people have no money, so they don't have uh, electronic means of contact or they have mental illness. It's a real problem. And if you can lower the failure to appear at that rate, to get more people to show up for their day in court, you can fix lots of injustice in the world. 
For a variety of reasons, they couldn't get to work on the failure to appear. No, no fault of their own, it had to do with different people focusing on different things. So they said, you know what we're gonna do? We're gonna create a visualization system to show the movement of people through the criminal justice system in Kentucky. And as a result, they created kind of an analytical dashboard to see by crime, by race, by gender, by which judge, by what time of year, where things were getting stuck. And it immediately became apparent where the bottlenecks were. So if you're trying to innovate and you can't get innovation, collect data and use that data to prove that there's a need for innovation. David Boyle at EMI had billions of rows of, of music transactions, purchases of EMI that he could have gone through, but he wasn't allowed to touch them. So David created a survey, over a million respondents worldwide on how people buy music. He ran this program for about a year, brought it to the executive team at EMI, and they went, wow, that's amazing. This is great data. Can we have some more? He said, well, if you want more, you gotta let me into this treasure trove of billions of rows of data. So he did some small amount of data, which earned him the permission to go and have access to the bigger data. So he used data to create a taste for data. Jenna Eggers was the CEO of Spreadshirt. She also started the innovation lab at Intel, uh, so I did do it. Um, she uses the Net Promoter Score. NPS or Net Promoter Score is how likely are you to recommend this product to someone else. It's a, it's a good proxy for customer satisfaction. And uh, they found that all of a sudden, the NPS for Norway went through the floor at Spreadshirt, which is a print on demand t shirt company. Most companies would go, oh, I guess Norway doesn't like t-shirts this week. That's the end, right? Jen is tenacious like a pit bull. So she called up the Norwegian consulate, and she started phoning around. Eventually, she found out from someone that Norway had just centralized all of its customs clearing. The package used to get done in the village, and now they were all done in the central area. And as a result, got through to someone there. So if you label your package in this way, it'll get fixed. So good entrepreneurs don't just collect the data. They actually go and figure out why. They keep digging and digging and digging until they find a root cause. Uh, another example from uh, DHL. Uh, so DHL, uh, I asked them, why don't you just wait for a startup and then acquire it? They said, well, you need to know which things you have to build yourself and which things you can acquire. And the example they gave you is something called MyWays. MyWays is a last mile delivery service for packages. So in many European cities, there's a station with combo locks into which DHL drops your package and then you go to the supermarket wherever you dial that number and you get your package in. This means you can say to someone, hey, I'll give you 10 bucks to bring me the package. Here's the combo number, here's my address. Mm. So DHL launched this program called MyWays in Stockholm a few months ago. And um, they decided to build it themselves. And I said, why would you build it yourself? Can't you just, I mean, there's gonna be 10 startups doing this. Like every startup accelerator I talk to has like an on-demand dog sitting service or something, right? Every one of them is gonna disrupt the dog sitting world. Um, <laughs> Sorry if you're running a dog sitting startup. Uh, so the problem they found was that if this was successful, they wanted to be able to turn it up worldwide overnight. For that to happen, it had to be tied into SAP, which was their system. Anybody here work with SAP? Yeah, so SAP is an amazing tool for running your company if you happen to be a large German company. <laughs> Fortunately, DHL is a large German company, so they love the SAP. So, um, Apologies if you're from SAP. I'm mean, really in trouble with me. So SAP was like it was very unlikely for them to find a startup that had built this thing for SAP. So they decided that was one reason to build it. But the most important reason, the constraint that they knew about, which amazed me, was under certain European laws, if you work more than a number of hours or earn more than a certain number of dollars in a given week, you become an inadvertent employee of that company. So DHL would have been on the hook for all bunch of new employees that we created by letting people spend their whole day delivering packages. So they needed to build in constraints by company for how many packages or how many hours. All these hidden constraints. So if you're an entrepreneur, yeah, you've got to shoot for the fences, right? But you've got to understand the constraints and realities of the business you're in, employment law and stuff like that. Um, I think you also got to think subversively. And this is the one that's hardest to teach. In Houston, they had a big problem. Houston, we got a problem. Um, so, uh, this is the conveyor belt in Houston. Uh, they uh, did a survey of people and all of the passengers said, my biggest complaint is it takes too long for our bags to come out. Did some tests, on average it took nine minutes for a bag to get from the airplane to the conveyor belt, which I think is pretty good, but apparently it's not very good. So they spent a year and millions of dollars retooling the airport. They got the time from plane to conveyor belt from nine minutes down to six minutes. Number one complaint, 
I have to wait too long for my bags to come. <laughs> and then a civil servant, an enterprising and possibly lazy civil servant, decided to park the planes further away from the conveyor belt for a month and complains with the zero because they didn't have to wait as long. I mean, they walked, but no one was complaining about that. This is thinking subversively. It's like a kind of laziness. If I give you two tests, one is retool the airport, the other is park the planes further away, which one lets you go home at night? Take hey, that one. And this is, it's not laziness, because you really want to fix the problem. But it's finding that, that hack, that exploit, that way of getting the system to do something it's not supposed to do, test something. Really smart entrepreneurs understand where the risk actually is. It's very hard to find that. And then once you've got the data, you have to convince people to have the right outcomes. So uh, I'll give you two examples of this. They're kind of interesting. If I stay in a hotel tonight, I will. I'm staying up near the airport. Thank you very much. Um, but if I stay in a hotel tonight, and there is a sign saying, please reuse your towels, I have a certain likelihood of using my towels. If the sign says, other people who stay in this hotel reuse their towels, please reuse your towel, I have 26% more likely to do so. If the sign says, other people who stayed in this room reuse their towels, I'm 33% more likely to do so. <laughs> kind of creepy, because you think those towels haven't been washed as much, right? So, <laughs> anyway, um, this kind of knowledge allows us to take data and change people's behavior. It's not just about collecting the data, it's about finding ways to use it. And I'll give you the second example, which I think is the really painful. Uh, so there was a study done on energy consumption. Uh, and uh, Daniel Goroff from the Sloan Foundation told me about this. They sent out notes to people saying, your energy consumption from your air conditioner is higher or lower than your neighbor's. If they sent out a thing saying your energy consumption was higher than your neighbor's, and that person was a Democrat, they would reduce consumption. If they sent out a thing saying your consumption was lower than your neighbors, and that person was a Republican, they would increase their consumption. <laughs> so you can't tell this joke in the Midwest. Just the so the reality is if you want to produce an outcome of net drop in energy consumption, it's not enough to have the data on how much, you know, if you just sent the data, here's the data, without thinking about the outcome you want, you probably have no overall effect. You actually need to know data and political affiliation to understand how to produce the desired outcome. So it's not as simple as taking the data. You've got to understand the end goal you have. I like the punchline, so I didn't put this up. Uh, I think it's also important to take baby steps. Baby steps. This is something that entrepreneurs tend to have a problem with. Uh, I mentioned earlier Netflix, right? It wasn't called Postal Flix, but they had this great baby step of turning the US Postal Service into a very high throughput, very, very high latency broadband connection. Uh, Elon Musk, the first Tesla was a sports car, because those kinds of people tolerated the tweaking that was going to have to happen. Uh, Twitter, we all forget why Twitter is 140 characters. It's because early on, not everyone had smartphones, and so SMS was 160 characters, and the Twitter handle was 20 characters, therefore you have 140 left of the message. All these companies found baby steps, ways to get to the market without delivering the whole thing from the outset. So across the different companies that I looked at for this kind of innovation, uh, most of them put 70% of their investment into this kind of core innovation stuff, 20% into this adjacent innovation stuff, and about 10% into transformative innovation. And over time, when you look at the results of that investment, they tend to have the greatest return from that really transformative stuff. It's very high risk, but when it works, boy, does it work. So smart entrepreneurs and smart organizations have this understanding of a portfolio. And they take people who have those subversive kind of skills and abilities to make those change, and they put them in charge of transformation. And they use traditional machine learning and optimization for the core stuff. Uh, we jokingly once said that uh, machines are for optimization and humans are for inspiration. And I think that's a really true statement. Machines are really good at climbing up the current hill. Humans are really good at finding a new hill. And organizations that want to innovate tend to have to worry about that stuff. So I'll close with this remark by Lloyd Nelson. The most important figures that one needs for management are unknown or unknowable, but you still need to account for them. Everybody here has heard of Archimedes? So Archimedes um, worked for a king. King was kind of vindictive. He'd ask someone to make a crown. I need the crown. King went, eh, it feels a little light. I think the guy ripped me off and mixed in some other alloy. Hey, Archie, 
whatever you call them, to, can you measure this for me and tell me, and part of me is what to do. That's tough because it's an irregularly shaped solid, so figuring out its density is a little challenging. I'm gonna go to the bath and think about it. Because so he got in the bath and the water level went up and he went, Eureka, I've got it. And there's a story that goes, he ran through the street naked, going, I didn't figure that. It, the science is actually different. He actually figured it out a different way. He probably didn't run naked through the street. King was a vindictive bastard. Crown was fake. Guy got beheaded. It's not my story. That's not the point of my story. The point of my story is that Archimedes had taken baths before. <laughs> there was nothing new, I think he'd taken. I mean, these guys love to bathe, right? So I think he had. The point is that the act of asking Archimedes the question made him realize the answers were all around him. We live in this era where data is so abundant, it's constantly competing for our attention. Once upon a time, and before the big data era, a leader convinced others to act in the absence of data. Today, a leader is the person who knows what questions to ask. So with that, if you want to yell at me here or on Twitter, I've got time for some questions. Um, Solve for Interesting is where I rant about all kinds of stuff. Tilt the Windmill is this new project I've got on innovation. I do, I've got a bunch of interviews there with different people. And Strata is this big data conference we run here in the spring and in New York in the fall and in Barcelona in November that um, kind of got away from us and became this really big conference that we enjoyed playing on. So thank you very much. You guys have questions, you have questions and yeah. wait for the microphone because it's being recorded. Or you may have no questions because your heads are full and you've had your beer and <laughs> going to go home, that's fine too. Of the lean startup <coughs> what are the weaknesses of the lean startup approach? What are the, what are they? Yeah. Um, so I think the lean startup approach on its own is a very bad thing because lean startup is to product management what agile is to software development or continuous deployment is to operations. And all of those things need to work in concert. If you aren't able to read, like I talked to some people at Telefonica, who, big, big Spanish telco, and they were prototyping a device for uh, old people to use smartphones. And they had to go and get like the legal department to understand what they were doing so the legal department could quickly iterate on the terms of service for the prototypes as they came out with new versions. So unless you have the rest of the organization spun up to be agile, to be lean, to be continuous, uh, it can cause all kinds of tensions. And I think um, most organizations like budgetary cycles. So uh, I think I made some comment the other day that um, asking a startup for a business plan is like asking Columbus for a map of the world before he sits there. Um, you have a business idea, you do some testing, now you have a business model. You validate those assumptions, and that business model over time becomes a business plan. But the company wants a business plan. That's why I like the DHL example of like, oh yeah, our plan is to make a report. It's going to cost half a million dollars, right? And you have to shield it because the the desire an organization has for certainty runs afoul of the desire a lean entrepreneur has for discovering and quantifying the uncertain. And I think unless you have a top-down buy-in and have trained the rest of your, like people like the lawyers, telling the design team they might have to iterate on logos more quickly than, it doesn't have to be as good as usual, but you might have to do it tomorrow. You've got to spin up the whole organization. So I, I think the biggest challenge is people underestimate in large organizations the amount of training and preparation and resistance that the rest of the organization will produce that gets in the way of the entrepreneur. That's my guess. So how do you overcome that resistance? Uh, Top-down authority. You hire everybody's, um, no, uh, top-down authority, and I think um, small projects. You have to find one thing that works and then use that. And there's a lot of politics in this. I mean, we have this um, thing we talk about in the book called the Lean Analytics Cycle. I'm amazed at how much people like this because to me it's just science. It's like, have a, have a metric you want to change, form a hypothesis about how to change it, 
test the hypothesis, did it move the needle? Like that's just science, right? But for some reason, this is probably because a lot of social media people want the book, they went, ooh, that's interesting. Um, liberal arts degrees. So, um, I can say that, I'm on HP. So uh, that iteration, that, that cycle, um, can be applied, normally you'd say, what metric should we try and fix? And a purist would say, well, I've taken my business model, I've looked at where I am, I looked at where I need to be, where's the biggest gap, what's most on fire, fix that. The politician might say, which one will my boss be most interested in? Or which one is going to be most visible to the executive team? So, so choose the metric you're trying to fix politically, and you'll probably, I mean, David Boyle did a great example of this, where he said, he said, you can't have this data, he said, I'm gonna go do the survey project, and the results were so amazing that then they were like, do more, we'll give you your data, okay. So you have to, I think, you have to find projects that are the right size. Uh, and some of that comes down to building this three horizons model because the transformative uh, horizon is isolated. Those guys don't, have no idea what business unit they'll live in. They may actually be trying to destroy an existing business unit. The adjacent is probably an innovation group in the line of business. And then the core is just people doing their jobs. And so I think that's, the, the reason I like that three maximum model is it shows you there's a need for isolation. Simon Wortley, who has a brilliant blog called Guard Evens, uh, talks about pioneers, settlers, and town planners. So pioneers are definitely that, that third right, that third maximum, um, and they sort of want to go break it. They, they hate being restricted to new things, uh, to existing things. Um, settlers say, ooh, nice place you found pioneers, let me build something here. And town planners come in and go on the roads go here, and the traffic lights go here. And you have to recognize those three. And I think that comes from the top. Right? You're setting up your organization now. Yes? She's going to run over with the mic. Hi. Hi. What would you, uh, what do you love about the United States healthcare? What don't you like about the Queen's love country, the Canadian? What do I love about United States healthcare? What, the United, United, what I love about the United States healthcare is it's the and best. What health. would you? What? What? And what? I, what? Um, and those? Um, and that would transform a bit. Sure. Okay. So I'm happy to be political. Um, <laughs> the United States has the best healthcare in the world. For some of you. <laughs> it's true. I mean, there's a reason why your average life expectancy is lower than ours because I've never met an average person, right? Some people aren't going to live very long because they live in the inner city and eat junk food, and some people have organic colonics all the time and they live really long. And there's, there's, so Kaiser Permanente is a great example of a healthcare organization that works. If you want my true thoughts on healthcare, here they are. Get off the fence. You can either have a free market healthcare system with price transparency, which you're not allowed to have today, by the way, because you're not allowed to tell anyone, or a socialized medicine system where you're all in it together and everyone pays taxes because nobody knows who's going to get cancer. Right now what you have is like right in the middle. You've got Medicare and Medicaid for some people, and everybody pays insurance, but it's run by corporations. You get to choose what your reproductive rights are and stuff. That's like the whole Hobby Lobby thing came because you're sitting in this straddling model where you're neither a free market nor a social model. So what I love about American healthcare is it's the best healthcare system in the world, no doubt. But what, what I hate about Canadian healthcare is that occasionally I have to wait two weeks to see a doctor because my leg hasn't fallen off. I'm okay with that. How do you like it? How do I like it? We're really, this has nothing to do with lean, but. <laughs> so I, I'm gonna get back to lean for a little bit here. I have a problem with what's called jerk tech. Um, you guys also the, the parking app that lets you like sell your parking spot to someone else? <laughs> this is actually a technology problem. We used to have things that were free and things that were expensive. And there was this area in the middle where things were too cheap to bill for. Like the cost of measuring it would be too expensive, right? But with the Internet of Things, we have created a vacuum where there's now the ability to bill for your parking spot and things like that. And all of these companies are running in to fill that vacuum and government is not running in to fill that vacuum. I mean, a city could easily say, we've built a parking optimization application that shows you where the next available parking spot is. Because maybe there's something wonderful about the fact that me and my crappy car and you and your fancy Tesla looking for parking spots, we're on a level playing field, even though your car costs 10 times what mine did. Maybe that's okay. So I think one of the things that's happening right now is we have, we have found this new place to colonize, 
called things that were too cheap to bill for, too expensive to bill for before, but are now billable. And we are not having a discussion about whether they should be colonized by our governments and mayors and whatever, or free enterprise. And as a result, we're going to go to this slippery slope where everything you do is billable. And I think that's, um, that's probably a uh, social consequence of the Internet of Things that we haven't thought about much. Yes? I have a question. I have two questions. One is that in your discussion, Apple may not even come up in the discussion. Uh, I did say long term shareholders where one person has a large control of the company. But yes. The other part of the question is that we involve the integrator group. You're talking about this thing small, take baby steps and all that. Some of the companies you can't hear. You've got to get the validation. Sorry, can you, can you start again? Hold the mic like, like straight here. Go ahead. The second part of the question is I was involved with the incubator where we started about 20 companies. We got the validation by uh, being in front of the VCs and just money and all that. We had about $500 million. So filing for patents and everything, do you consider that as part of the um, baby step? Or, uh, do you so I, I have, um, it's a long topic. Uh, so I think patents are important if the thing that you are patenting is intrinsic to your identity, right? And then it creates some value. I'm not sure um, that VCs investing in you is any validation unless you're selling like really expensive wine cellars or fast cars. Um, the, the hardest thing for an entrepreneur is to understand that they are not their own target market. I used to have a t-shirt that said your mom is not a so, uh, you, your non, mom is not a valid test market. Um, and my mom's pretty technical, but I would never want her opinions because she wants to make me feel good, right? Um, we tend to celebrate things like, oh, I closed the 10 million Series A. We should celebrate things like, the first person I've never met bought something from me. That's a milestone, right? And so I think we celebrate the wrong things. And the hardest thing to do, a lot of the startups I advise, it's because they're so in the weeds, they're so busy day to day, they can't see the forest from the trees. Being in there, um, I think to your Apple comment, the reason that Apple had historically done a good job with this, there was this great interview where um, Bill Gates was talking about the Zoom, and someone asked Steve Jobs about the Zoom's song sharing feature where you could like share a song with someone else. And Steve Jobs said to the interviewer, that's not sexy. You know what's sexy? This is. Just took an earphone, held it next to the, the interviewer's ear. And there's a sense of, like, of course, if you want to hear a song, I'm going to go here, listen to this. And maybe that's like flirting, right? I think understanding that, that social intimacy, um, understanding that it's not about the features, it's about what people will actually do. And it's very hard to tell what people will do um, unless you actually get in front of the market. So uh, some of this applies to the consumer stuff. Uh, what I didn't get into, and we talk about it in a chapter in the book, is how to apply lean analytics for B2B enterprise customers. And in those cases, there's a proxy for each of these stages. So you tend to do consultative work, like you become a consultant to 10 companies, and see if 90% of what you offer to those 10 companies is the same. And by the way, if what I do for these 10 companies as a consultant is the same for all 10 of them, the 10, if, if, sorry, if 90% of it's the same for all those 10 companies, the 10% that's different, if I could figure out how to automate that, that's my intellectual property. Imagine I did B2B stuff for all of you, and 90% of you have exactly the same stuff. That's easy, commoditize that, make it a utility. What's the 10% that's hard to commoditize? If I can figure out how to automate that, now I've got a business where I've created sustainable competitive advantage, and that's what I should have. So there's steps like that. You can use consulting as a proxy for stickiness, and you can use motor score and case studies as a proxy for virality, and so on. Not sure I answered your question. Yes? Anybody see a pair of sunglasses? They weren't like green and white, so they gave out a whole bunch. Not those ones. Uh, hello. How would you convince upper management uh, without using fear? Because the uh, life expectancy argument is very, uh, I guess, it's a very good argument. That, uh, and actually, there was, when Xerox created Park, it was out of the fear from the pay products office. Uh, so fear is very powerful, but uh, what would you use greed. as another argument? So, so humans are only motivated by two things, fear and greed. Uh, we generally call those cost and uh, revenue. Um, and I'm a big believer that uh, cost is, is like one-fifth and revenue is four-fifths. Uh, because 
I can only get costs down to zero. I mean, I can get the costs of any company down to zero right away <laughs> by shutting down a company, right? Whereas humans tend to be optimistic. It's why we play the lottery. And so you're always going to believe the revenue will go higher. So it's greed. Um, I think the, the other thing I would say is um, that there's a time frame. Everybody knows they need to do it, they'll defer it. And if you look at what happened to, um, was it Kodo, the Barnes and Noble reader? They put in like half a million, half a billion dollars in that product. It failed miserably. They did all the same stuff as Amazon, they tried to do a whole bunch of things, but they were too late at the end. So what I would use as examples of, you need to build the ecosystem early on, and it's non-obvious what will happen there. Uh, Bob Metcalf had this great comment about, um, we got the internet exactly backwards. He said, in the old days, we used to use satellites for long haul transmission and wires for local connections. Now we use wires for long haul transmission and wireless for local connections. And he jokingly said that the profits of Cisco for 10 years solid could be explained as, we just turned all the internet pieces around, right? <laughs> Give it a look at it. Um, that's a trend that if you didn't understand that this is going to cause 10 years of sale of internet hardware, you couldn't get ahead of, right? And so the problem is always that the consequences of these things are not obvious until later. You remember Wall Street, Gordon Gecko on the beach with a brick to his head? Like the cell phone was the domain of the really wealthy. So if you looked at that, you'd be like, ah, how many executives are there in the world? That's how many you need. Turns out it's a way to keep track of the kids and send a shopping list to your spouse and all. So um, the, the, it's hard to convince an executive of this stuff. Um, the, there's a, uh, you guys ever heard of Jevons Paradox? So William Stanley Jevons was an economist who was tasked with understanding how far the British Empire could run on its coal. Um, and he noticed, of the two steam engines that I showed you, that when the Newcomen steam engine was replaced by the Watt steam engine, we should have had four times as much coal. I mean, it was four times as efficient, so we should have been able to go four times as far. And yet he found that the more efficient the machines got, the engines got, the more we consumed coal. 